with uh, Nancy's introduction, I was remembering one of my favorite movies when I was a kid, uh, Brewster's Millions, where we had to spend uh, 30 million, and this is Richard Pryor, 30 million in 30 days, but I did the math here and it's $125,000 a second to try and convey an idea. Um, okay, so, uh, Let me just, I'll start with a slide that's largely redundant with the conversation this morning. Um, the, the interpretation of, of genetic variation is a mission, critic, mission critical challenge for this institute and this community. Uh, at least two examples of where uh, it is currently rate limiting are, are variants of uncertain significance um, and genome wide associations. Uh, a related point, which I think there's also probably consensus on, is that simply sequencing more genomes isn't going to. Uh, effectively address um, the underlying challenges. So uh, I guess the question is w which way forward? Um, so computational prediction of variant functionality is certainly a viable and worthwhile goal, and uh, we and others have put a lot of work into developing algorithms that integrate various annotations, uh, functional annotations to a single score. Uh, based on our experiences to date, uh, I worry a little that trying to improve computational approaches to the place where we would like them to be um, may turn out to be a bit like squeezing blood from a turnip, so to speak, um, where the turnip represents present-day functional annotations and there's only so much information content that we'll be able to squeeze out. And so my point is not that we shouldn't be pursuing uh, improved methods for computational prediction, uh, like the FUNVAR initiative, which is great. Um, it's that we need more and better training data um, to complement or, or proceed these efforts. So, uh, okay, so one path forward um, to address the challenges in the framework of a scaled program would be to pursue experimental measurement of uh, the functional consequences of a very large number of variants. So for a budget of, of 10 to 20 million uh, in each of five years, um, I don't think it's absurd to think about numbers like 10 million um, as estimates of what might be possible, which equates to about one in every thousand of all possible SNVs. Um, and I'll, I'll add that there are, of course, a lot of w different ways to slice the question of how to pursue large-scale um, functional studies, and I've, uh, what I've really tried to focus on is how to maximize this number of how many variants that one is looking at, um, perhaps at the expense of, of other considerations. So, so 10 million is an ambitious number, but if you suspend your disbelief for a second and say we could do it, what would we gain? Um, first, uh, absolutely massive uh, training uh, set for um, improving uh, predictive algorithms. For coding reasons, this would be about a thousand-fold larger than the data sets that are available today uh, for training. For non-coding reasons, it would be effectively infinitely larger since we hardly, hardly have anything uh, at all. Um, second, uh, this goes back to one of the points this morning about biology um, being a goal. So sequence structure function maps for diverse classes of sequence elements. Um, so really informing biology at a base pair level resolution that's not really accessed by current efforts in functional genomics. Um, and then lastly, the, the measurements themselves, which could potentially improve uh, interpretation of, of VUSs as well as fine mapping of, of associations. So uh, how would one in practice get to functional analysis of 10 million variants? So the answer, of course, would have to uh, require, um, would likely require some large degree of multiplexing. Um, this is a workflow from a collaboration with Len Panaccio and Nadav Huitev. Uh, Joe Ecker brought up this general classes of approach, uh, approaches uh, earlier today. So in a nutshell, this is, uh, involves first generating a comprehensive allelic series uh, of, a, let's say, a single mammalian enhancer in, in one reaction with each variant linked to a transcribed barcode, uh, then putting this, this population of, of enhancer variants through a uh, massively parallel functional assay, and then finally using sequencing as a readout where you read out the uh, transcribed uh, barcodes in RNA and infer or estimate the effect sizes of each possible mutation on the enhancer, and this is all in one experiment. So um, here's, a, here's an example of such an experiment. So this is a 250 base pair intronic enhancer of ALDO B, which with position on the X axis and log fold change on the Y axis. And so we've effectively generated, um, and this is, this is remarkably reproducible and, and, and quite sensitive, um, measurements for the functional effects of about 750 non-coding mutations in one experiment. So, um, uh, of course, as it came up this morning as well, um, we want to do functional studies on coding variants as well. So here it's more challenging uh, because ideally you'd, you'd want to introduce one and only one uh, mutation to a full-length ORF. Um, so Jacob Kitzman, uh, who just started his lab at the University of Michigan, uh, recently worked out one method to do this, um, term PALS, 
where one uses microarray-derived oligos um, to program an allelic series of all possible codon substitutions um, to an ORF in a single reaction. Um, and then some of my colleagues at UW, Leah Sharita and Stan Fields, have applied this method uh, to the analysis of BRCA1, uh, in particular uh, BRCA1, BARD1 interactions, and have generated uh, just beautiful maps of the relative effects of nearly all possible amino acid substitutions um, in this region of BRCA1 that interacts with BARD1, um, and then these can be then correlated with structure to inform biological understanding of the interaction, um, but also evaluated for utility uh, in predicting the pathogenicity of, of clinical variants. Um, and so there, there, there are a lot of groups that have developed methods related to the examples that I gave, uh, and the take-home messages that the underlying technologies that would be necessary are already there or are rapidly maturing. Um, in practical terms, uh, what would be the rate limiting factors for scaling this? So first, uh, producing allelic series at scale um, would be one challenge. And the second, and this would probably be the, the harder one, would be adapting uh, diversity of cellular and molecular assays to multiplex readout. Um, but I think in sharp, contra in sharp contrast with, with uh, other large scale projects, um, sequencing would be the least of the challenges, and I think it would be a, kind of a different portfolio of, of what would be hard about, about this project. So in terms of actually uh, generating allelic series, um, it's much easier to imagine how one would get to a number like 10 million um, if we are talking about dense uh, or saturating mutagenesis, um, which encompasses both of the examples that I gave you, and you can imagine tackling um, 2,500 one kilobase regions would get you to 10 million, assuming that you had three substitutions and a deletion for every residue or nucleotide. Um, and this could be spread between uh, coding sequences, so let's say 500 clinically actionable genes and several thousand cis regulatory elements. Um, what I think is, you know, also came up a bit this morning in, in Joe Ecker's talk, but it's a bit difficult, more difficult to imagine with current methods is how to multiplex the functional analysis of sparsely located uh, variants, so viable candidates for, for GWAS associations. Um, but you can imagine with CRISPR or uh, uh, other related methods, um, there are possibilities, but probably on a, on a per variant basis, um, this is going to be much more expensive than uh, these dense approaches. Okay, so the other, the other challenge is, is functional assays, and, and the concepts in the slide are adapted um, from another one of my colleagues at UW, Doug Fowler. Uh, and the key point here is that one doesn't need to develop um, a thousand functional assays to study a thousand sequences of interest. So rather, you can funnel uh, related types of sequences into identical or at least similar assays. Um, and this, of course, applies to, to regulatory elements where you, you know, they, they can all be read out with transcriptional activation, at least in answers. Um, but you can also imagine that, that all members of a particular class of, of protein domains could be read out using uh, related um, assays. And then the second point is that once you have these allelic series constructed, um, for a particular uh, uh, element, regulatory element or protein of interest, you can essentially put the same allelic series through a variety of biochemical or cellular assays, um, including, for example, many cell lines. Um, and so we're really talking about building a matrix uh, where, uh, you know, you have 10 million rows and, and the columns are the experimental measurements, but once you build the first column, it becomes uh, easier to, to do more. So um, the limitations in this kind of data are familiar. We've lived with a context problem for the whole history of molecular biology. Um, functional assays are not humans, and molecular functionality is not pathogenicity. Um, but these are related attributes, and I, I think um, these can be informative about, about uh, one another. Uh, and so, and you can also imagine that, that the choice of context to pursue um, would presumably be informed by other projects like ENCODE and, and Roadmap and so on and so forth. Um, namely, what, you know, what cell type a particular enhancer is, is relevant to study in, for example. So um, how would the resulting data be used? Uh, so first, this would be a massive uh, database of experimental measurements associated with individual SNVs um, or, or point mutations. It would be dramatically larger than the training data sets um, that are available today uh, and, and might also, and I imagine there, there is, are probably different opinions on this, but could be directly useful as effectively pre-computed interpretations for VUSs in, in the most relevant genes. And this contrasts with the model of first waiting to see the variant and then trying to go back and, and do the functional analysis, which I think is pretty inefficient. Um, second, uh, the focus on translational implications is great. And again, as, as I think Eric brought up this morning, let's not lose sight of, of, of biology as a goal. 
Um, uh, and a data set like this would be informative about both structure and function at a single base pair resolution. And then once you learn lessons about, let's say, particular uh, you know, mutations at particular residues in, in protein domains, you can then extrapolate those residues to other members of a, of a functional class. Um, so uh, what would success depend on? So if you work backwards from uh, this, this kind of a budget um, and a goal of 10 million variants, you get to about $30,000 per kilobase of, of DNA subjected to saturation mutagenesis, which um, to me seems reasonably generous. Uh, as it turns out, doped oligosynthesis um, is already, uh, using microarrays is already very, very cheap. Um, so that in itself would probably not be the major cost barrier. Um, but success would depend on you know, be having better methods for producing allelic series. And then, um, again, probably more importantly, uh, developing functional assays that are compatible with multiplexing, um, scalable, and, and recyclable to different, different elements. Um, so it's a different, different set of activities and sequencing, but I think that the, the knowledge of uh, NHGRI um, could prove critical in, in figuring out how to effectively coordinate and scale a project like this. Um, a lot of the technical know-how to, to get started is already there, but you can imagine this proceeding in kind of a phase fashion um, with lessons uh, with respect to, to assay development and so on and so forth kind of applied as you go along. Uh, so I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Time for two questions. Jay? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I wasn't sure if your assays covered this, but one gnawing question is that we often assume a, a base change is a missense change when in fact it could be a splice change. So is there a way to take the coding region of a gene and determine whether every single base change impacts splicing in one of these assays? So uh, yeah, one could, I mean, you know, again, there can be both coding and non-coding basis that affect right. splicing. So probably the best way to do it would be to adapt uh, genome editing methods to similar kinds of multiplexing, um, where you're, you're effectively you know, doing dense mutagenesis of a, of a region uh, with, with those methods, and, and that's probably the way to go, and I think that's, that's certainly a possibility. Yeah, David. So I, I think you're on to exactly the right thing. I personally think this is, is incredibly important. I think um, two, two just uh, additions, I mean, I think it's great. One is, um, or there's going to be con assays of convenience that will report on some molecular function in your slide that says, you know, molecular function doesn't equal pathogenicity. One way of framing this is that we need to train our understanding of what assays are relevant based on the fact that they faithfully report the relationship between genotype and phenotype. That's point one. And then point two is that is of direct relevance to pharmaceutical development because the input to drug screening is an assay. And the key issue in drug development is, is that assay predictive of downstream clinical response? Because if it's not, you're going to spend 10 years till you figure it out when you have a drug, you do the clinical trials. So this is an incredibly important tri sort of triangle, if you will, of the assay, its genetic variation, the human, its disease variation, and then that goes into screening or, or informed screening. So let's not settle for the multiplex convenient, lots of stuff we can measure. No, no, I, I'm I, saying, and let's use it to figure out what should we be measuring. Absolutely. So I think, I think there's, so I agree with everything you said, and I think you made this point indirectly earlier this morning as well. Um, I think there's an argument for getting started with assays of convenience. Um, uh, and, you know, and I think, I think in many cases we'll be surprised by how little we know about which assays are the most relevant. Um, uh, but but I, I, your, your point is fully taken, and I, I agree 100%. <coughs> so yeah, I totally agree with David, and, and a corollary of that is that we should, you know, in tandem link this to actual you know, clinical genetic data so that you could see, okay, these p53 mutations that I'm predicting to have this, you know, effect, do I really see them in either tumor normal comparisons or in hereditary cancers and so on? So, I mean, you'd like to be able to have that kind of synergy between the actual record that you're seeing in, and what you're kind of measuring in the lab. But, uh, you know, many of us agree that, that this kind of high throughput functional screening is, is the way to go, particularly if you could pre-compute. Yeah, my guess is that groups of allele, there'll be groups of alleles that behave similarly, and you can probably, you know, use what data is available to, to, to you know, validate a particular subset as likely being clinically relevant and, and go from there, but yeah. So. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, sorry, Ewan, to, or, sorry to stop the questions, okay. but it's getting late, and I 
do want to move on.